welcome to Sparky Help. So this is video is on the resistance of a circuit and more importantly how to calculate R1 and R2 using the on-site guide. Ideal for those who are doing design or just want to know or do fault finding. So first things we need to do we want to work out what R1 R2 is. Well what do we need to know? R1 is the line conductor and R2 is the CPC of a particular circuit. So we'll take a, an example from a previous video. So this is cable calculations, uh, easy guide too. So please go look at it and you will see we have already calculated the cable for this example that you see in front of you. So what can we, what have we got? We have a thermoplastic 70 degrees single core cable, 28 meters in length. All of this needs to be information you need to know about. It is fed from a single phase neutral TNCS. And when, on this occasion, we're going to assume ZE is 0.25 of an ohm. Uh, the load well, this was based on was 8.4 kilowatt and it was protected by a 40 amp type B BSEN 60898. So that's just a normal circuit breaker. So as we've already said, the first thing we need to do uh, from the example is we need to decide on a CPC. So the cable size that we come up with in the cable size and video was a 16 mil based on that information. Now, obviously, I've already done another video on sizing the earth and we could do it the easy way. The easy way would be put a 16 mil CPC in and then we wouldn't need to bother doing any more calculations. But you still might want to know what your R1 and R2 is. On this occasion, what we're going to do is we're not going to do 16 mil. We're going to try for a 6 mil and see where that gets us. So, using the on-site guide, and we go to Appendix I. Appendix I, as you can see on there, resistance of copper and aluminium conductors. Uh, you'll see a formula there at the top up here. If we show you just this bit here, you will see that is effectively the adiabatic equation. Watch out for another video on that one. Uh, here we've got an Ohm's Law formula. This is working at the fault current based on UO and ZS. But we've also got the important part, what we're going to look at, where well, it's all important, but... We've got ZS equals ZE plus R1 and R2. And R1 and R2 are in brackets because that's your circuit that you install. ZE obviously is external to the electrical supply, although technically you could have something called ZDB. So based on this particular section of the on-site guide, we have this formula which is based on what we just looked at, but we've added a few more bits in. So we've still got ZS, obviously. ZS is the furthest point of the circuit. We'll come to that. ZE is external. We have R1 and R2. And we have uh, more calculations involved in that. We've got times the length, times the factors. Now, there should be some brackets around R1 and R2. I just noticed now, but um, if it's all one figure, then you don't need to worry. But you'll see in a bit. And then we've got divide by a thousand. So what do they all mean? And as we've just said, then ZS is the earth fault loop impedance of the circuit. Well, what is earth fault loop impedance? Well, here we have a circuit from a supply transformer, and this happens to be a TNCS right the way back to the transformer through the service cutout, through the double pole isolator, through the protected device of our circuit. There is R1, which is a line conductor of our circuit, your electrical load or loads or whatever it happens to be. And then R2 is your CPC back, back to the MET, the main earthing terminal, and then back through the supply cable. So what we've not drawn on this, and we tend not to bother drawing, is all the metering and, and uh, equipment like that, because it's just not relevant um, for this particular thing. We just need to show them a simplistic way where everything happens to be. So like I say, this is a TNCS, back to the star point, and we've just drawn it single phase, four E's. I apologise for my winding over here. Uh, drawn freehand using a mouse, which is not the best thing in the world. So what is ZS then? So ZS is the particular colour that I've just selected to go around. So it is a, as if we just get a fault at the furthest point of every circuit from the line conductor down to earth, hence R1 to R2, and then back through the MAT, through the earthing conductor, back through the pen conductor, star point, through the transformer, back through the service cable, service fuse, back through your tails, main switch, 
protective device, your line conductor and background the load. And it goes in that particular path. So that therefore is ZS of a particular circuit. ZE. Well, ZE, external earth fault blue impedance. Um, as I've said on there, it could also be the ZDB. And ZDB comes into play if you have multiple distribution boards. Obviously, there is only one ZE typically within a building, and that's where your incoming cable comes in from the supply authority. But you then might supply a submain to something. So that submain would become ZDB for a circuit connected. So let's, for example, in a house, you have a supply come in. That then to a distribution board, which is your main distribution board, and that is where ZE would be. However, you might decide, I'm going to put a small distribution board in the garage or an outbuilding and then run circuits off of that. So if you was to measure the earth loop path at the distribution board in the garage or shed or whatever it happens to be, that would become the ZDB and not ZE. So let's just have a quick look, uh, hopefully from all that description, from your knowledge, you should already know. Um, so therefore, ZE then is on this particular point here. It's at the origin of the installation. So on the incoming point, and it's a very badly drawn, but it is, shows the point, it shows the fault path around that particular point, and it is external to the installation. So therefore, that is ZE. R1, resistance of the line conductor. Well, we've just seen what the resistance of the line conductor, where it is, it's the cable you've installed and happens to be, in our case, or our example, happens to be a 16 mil. So from that, we can need to work out its resistance, but you need to know its size and your length. We already know all that. And we go to appendix I and we go to table I1. And here we have a table I1 and its resistance per meter R1, R2, of copper and aluminium conductors at 20 degrees. Now we can see how to read this table. It says down here this is the line conductor. The second column in says the protective conductor. So effectively it's is R1 and R2. It doesn't matter. They're just copper conductors. It doesn't matter if they're neutrals. Two phases, it makes no odds. You'll notice just going to look at the top here, it says one and then a dash. And basically what you can then do from this, you can do mix and match. So if you do just do a one with a dash, and you go to copper because there's no aluminium because I don't make one that small, it'd be 18.1, and this is milliohms per meter of a one mil cable. If we go for one one, what that will do, obviously it's double that, it's 36.2, and that is the resistance of one meter there and back of one cable. So we can mix and match, but it's ideal for working out most twin and earth cables. So if we look at a 2.5 with a 1.5 earth. That would be 19.51 milliohms per meter. But we've got a 16 mil conductor. And if we look down here, we can see our 16 mil conductor. And we just look at the dash because we don't know. We know the Earth is going to be completely different size. And I'll separate them too. So it's 1.15. So that's that particular one. So we can just get that conductor there just looking at R1. R2, resistance of the circuit protective conductor, CPC. And again, this also comes from appendix I from table I1 from the on-site guide. So we looked at that and we basically said it was going to be a 6 mil. So going from here, we have our 6 mil cable by itself is 3.08. And that therefore is the resistance of just the CPC as it stands. Down here I could have had, actually could have just gone straight to this one here actually, I could have gone 16 and 6 by itself and 4.23 and it would have just added them already for me. But I haven't. So L is the length of the circuit. L is the length of the circuit and that was given in the previous video. So the length will be whatever you happen to work it out at. So if you've got a scale drawing, measure it. If you've just installed it, you could work it out. But remember, all this could be a rearranged. You could work backwards and find out what the length of your cable happens to be. F, well, F is the factor taken into account, and it takes temperature into account, because we may have seen on the table a minute ago, the resistance of all those conductors was at 20 degrees. Now, now that's more like the temperature when you're generally installing cables. 
But on this occasion, what we're going to do is because we're going to compare it with the regulations, that's BS 7671, we're going to correct it for temperature as if it's operating temperature, and that will depend on its type of cable. And that comes from table I3 from the on-site guide, like so. So this then is applied, and depending on the type of your cable, so if you've got a thermo setting 90 degree cable, depending how the earth and the conductors are run, so is it incorporated in a cable or bunched, Again, it says C note 2 down there, and you'd multiply it all by 1.28, and that would raise the resistance of that conductor as if it was running at 90 degrees, which is its worst case scenario. If you have a thermoplastic and it's incorporated in a cable or bunched, it would be 1.2. If it's not bunched or not, not in a cable, then it would be a different figure, as you can see on there. So, our particular one was a 70 degree C thermoplastic and it was not incorporated because it's in singles and trunking so it's 1.2 would be the figure that goes in. And then we've got divide by a thousand. Why divide by a thousand? Well because the R1 and R2 they are in milliohms and milli is a thousandth so if you don't forget to uh, divide by a thousand you'll get completely the wrong answer but you could put it in as times 10 to the minus 3 to power of minus 3 if that's what you wish, but as long as you take it into account, I've just shown it as divide by a thousand. So let's look at it. So here's our formula. This time I have put it in brackets because we got them individually. I could have put them in as one. So ZS equals ZE plus, and we've got R1 plus R2, which is your line and CPC, times by the length, times by the factors, divide by a thousand. Now remember, we're only do the times F the, and the length on R1, R2. We don't do this to ZE because we're not going to affect ZE because these are the supply cable. It's just our circuit that we apply these calculations to. So the, the brackets are very important. Don't forget to put them in. You do not want to time ZE by the length or times that by any factors or divide it by a thousand. So there's our figures that we got. So there was 0.25 from the original question. There's our line conductor was 1.15, 3.08, times our length of 28, times 1.2, divided by 1,000. So there's R1 and R2 added together, which it did actually have in the book as 1, uh, times 28, which is the length. And then all the right-hand side turns into 0.142. So that's effectively your R1 and R2 of your line and earth. And remember, this is at 70 degrees C. And therefore, when we add these together, you can get the ZS. So we now know what the test results will be when working. So this is their worst case scenario. So it's 0.392 to three decimal places in this particular case. Two would be perfectly adequate. So there's our value. 0.392 is a fairly straightforward calculation, just a bit of looking up. This can now be checked, as it says on there, for the maximum from BS7671. And it is specifically from BS7671, not the ones from the on-site guide, because the on-site guide have already been corrected for temperature. But we've gone the other way and we've made this one up to temperature. See one of the other videos where I've done it, where I haven't applied the temperature to it. So we go and look at BS7671. It comes from table 41.3. There's our type B circuit breaker. And we have a 40 amp, and that has a maximum ZS of 1.15 ohms. That can now be compared um, with our calculated value, and our calculated value is 0.392. And this was less than or equal to 1.15, so we're not above it, which means our 3.92 ZS is perfectly adequate. So here's an example using the on-site guide to find a fault in a particular circuit. So this will look at a, an example of a 2515 twin and earth cable has a short circuit. Remember short circuits you'll find by doing an insulation resistance test. So if you're very lucky or unlucky, depending on your point of view, of finding one in the first place. But if you are trying to locate it, the next thing we could do is we could do a continuity test and actually find the resistance of it. And if you're very lucky and it is a complete dead short, 
we can get a reading. And so using continuity, we can find the reading of R1 plus Rn. And in our example, just to make life easy, it comes out at 0.18 of an ohm. So that's the resistance of the line and neutral uh, where the short circuit happens to be on this length of cable. What we can then do is we can use the on-site guide again. But this time we're not interested in it. it's a line conductor or protective conductor. We're interested in the fact that the line and neutral are 2.5s. So a 2.5 and a 2.5 is 14.82 milliohms per meter of this particular cable. We can rearrange the formula or put a formula in the length of the cable, which is what we're trying to find out, which then allows you to then locate it without digging the entire garden up or ripping the ceilings out. Or whatever it happens to be. It's resistance divided by the resistance per meter of the cable. The resistance of the cable we've already got is 0.18. We divide that by 14.82. Remember that's in milli, but this time we times by 1000 and that gives us 12.15 meters. That is how far away from the point you are testing where the fault is likely to be. So I hope you've enjoyed this and hope you found it fairly straightforward and you could now apply it. Thank you very much.